So just to recap from last Sabbath, last Sabbath, there was a wise advisor that, um, oh, thank you so much. There was a wise advisor in chapter one named Mimukan. And Mimukan, there were seven princes, but he was the closest to King Xerxes. And he was one of those people that King Xerxes looked to, to get some advice. And Mimukin said to King Xerxes three advices. He gave him an advice. And the advice, if you remember back last Sabbath, was that Queen Vashti, King Xerxes' wife, disobeyed his order to have her come and parade herself in front of all these men. It was against Persian custom for a woman to do that, but it was also problematic to the king because you can't disobey the king. And so his own queen disobeyed him, and there were consequences as a result of that. And so what Mimukin did was he told the king, this is my advice, King Xerxes. One, you need to dismiss Queen Vashti. In other words, get rid of her. Two, you need to be able to find another queen. And three, you need to put out a royal decree. A royal decree because Queen Vashti disobeyed you. And as a result, we don't want other women in the kingdom to disobey their husbands. And so that was his advice to the king. Basically what it meant was that Queen Vashti's time was limited. She was not going to be a queen any longer. But we saw three what I call timeless lessons that we went over, and I'm not going to go over them other than to mention them this morning. One was that God has a plan. He had a plan for Queen Vashti. Despite the fact that she disobeyed her husband, the king, there was a plan. And this deals with the sovereignty of God. God is sovereign to do what he needs to do for our benefit. And so one, he had a plan. Two, he had a purpose. And the purpose was going to be twofold. For us, the purpose is Jeremiah 29, 11, that he has a purpose and a plan for us. But the plan also, or the purpose also, was that Queen Vashti would exit and enter Queen Esther. Because as I said last week, and we'll continue to say this, Queen Esther would become the savior for her people eventually. And so the last timeless principle was that God loves his people. He loved his people enough back then to bring in Queen Esther to be a savior to her people just as much as he loves us today. Amen? So God had a plan, God had a purpose, and God loves his people. 2,000 years ago and today in 2024. So having said that, we're in part four. We're going to cover the entire chapter two. And uh, our theme verse, as we've shared with you, the previous verses, is taken from Romans chapter 15, verse 4. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have what? We might have hope. Hope is one of those intangible things, but it's a very important component in the Christian life. We have the hope of the soon coming of Jesus, but we also have the hope that we're part of God's plan and that God has a purpose for us and that God loves us like he loved the Jews back 2,500 years ago. So our question this morning is, as Queen Vashti was being deposed and soon Queen Esther would come onto the scene, why was God's name hidden in the book of Esther? Because I've shared with you in previous sermons that this is one of two books that God's name is never mentioned. Lord, Yahweh, whatever. I do not, God's name is me, never mentioned in all ten chapters of the book of Esther. And so perhaps the reason why 
was that in this era in the Middle East, King Xerxes controlled from Persia to Ethiopia to India, is that they had thousands of different gods. And usually their names were mentioned in official documents in order to control the people who worship those particular gods. And perhaps that's one of the reasons why God's name is not mentioned here because it's God's sovereignty. God wanted to be able to work through his people and especially the two that we're going to touch base with today and next week. The Jews were a unique people in being that they were believers of one God. One God and we see that in Deuteronomy chapter 6 called the Shema, which says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is what? The Lord is one. Different than all the other peoples in the, in the Middle East at that time, under the, the rule of King Xerxes, because thousands of gods existed and were worshipped. But the Jews were unique because they only worshipped one God. They were a monotheistic people. They were brought by God to be able to share to a pagan world that there's only one true God. And so the Jews worship this one true God, and therefore the story of the Jewish people was naturally a story of God. And so the Jews are highlighted through this book of Esther, but not God's name. Because God wanted his people to be able to infuse or infect the pagans around them that there's only one true God and for even the name Jew carried with it the connotation of one who worshiped Yahweh Yahweh the great I am taken from Exodus chapter 3 Yahweh represented as we would say as Christians Jesus it's the great I am Although God's name is not mentioned in the Hebrew text of the book of Esther, he makes himself known throughout the pages of this epic book as the unseen God. And that's why I take the, the title, God Behind the Scenes. Even though we don't see God's name mentioned in the book of Esther, even though there might be times in our lives that we don't feel that God is there because we can't see him or because maybe we think that he hasn't heard our prayers, God is there. Amen? God is always behind the scenes. He's there through the Holy Spirit. He's there when we read scripture. He's there when we are praying to him. We might not see him, but he's the God behind the scenes, the unseen God. Well, let's see if this, okay, now it works. So verse 1, chapter 2 says, but after Xerxes' anger had subsided, why, why was he angry? He was angry because his queen disobeyed him. He got the advice from this wise prince, sort of, I don't really think he was that wise, Memukin, to depose Queen Vashti. And so the text says, but after, after his anger had subsided, there's five key words here that I'm going to zero in on, but let me read the text. He began thinking about Vashti and what she had done and the decree that he had made, because he made a decree. This not-so-wise advisor, Mimukin, wanted to make sure that he was going to have this, this, this decree so that other wives throughout his kingdom would not disobey their husbands. And so there's a five-word phrase here that I want us to, to, to zero in on. He began what? Thinking about Vashti. Now maybe he was thinking because he missed his queen. And he probably was. He was probably a little lonely. He was probably thinking, wow, I'm not going to have her around anymore because I'm dis deposing her. She's not going to be the queen anymore. He did not know, like God knows, because God is sovereign, that on the scene soon would be Esther. So this text is very interesting because it says, 
But after his anger had subsided, he began thinking about Vashti. This five-word phrase that he began thinking about Vashti may mean that he, he, was, he was missing her, that he was lonely. Yet the king also remembered that in his anger, he had banished her from his presence because he had a decree. He had the decree that Memukan had encouraged him to put together to protect the other husbands in the province, in his kingdom. This is not going forward, unfortunately. Oh, there we go. Okay, it's a little slow. Verse 2, chapter 2. So his personal attendants suggested, let us search the empire to find beautiful virgins for the king. Let the king appoint agents in each province to bring these beautiful young women into the royal harem at the fortress of Susa. Now the fortress is just another word for palace. It was his palace. Haggai, the king's eunuch in charge of the harem, will see that they are all given beauty, what? Beauty treatments. Uh, I guess you could say that Xerxes was... Um, he was interested in their physical beauty. Verse 4. After that, the young women who most pleases the king would be made queen instead of Vashti. This advice was very appealing to the king, so he put the plan into effect. Now, he's no longer drunk. Because remember, he had a number of banquets before. Now he's not drunk. But pretty much he's thinking clearly and he's lonely. He wants to replace Vashti. He has a harem. So it wasn't about sex or romance for the king. He was probably desiring someone to be near to him. Someone to be his companion. Because he's realizing I had to listen to this wise, well actually he's unwise, Memukin to put this de decree together, but I'm lonely. I want a queen. And so Xerxes recognized this initially, or whether it came at the suggestion of his so-called wise men, the outcome is the same because they were seeking a mandate to seek a replacement for Queen Vashti. So whether or not he recognized it or not, he's now on a plan and this would not only get a wife for the king, but it was sure that she would be the most beautiful woman in Persia. Now begins the Miss Persia contest. Because in all of his provinces, the eunuch, Haggai, is going to go and choose the most beautiful woman, woman to be able to parade in front of the king. Verse 3a says, let the king appoint agents in each province to bring these beautiful young women into the royal harem at the fortress of Susa. He's eager to make this replacement. The ladies were giving beauty enhancements. You can't even go to Massage Envy and get the enhancements that they were going to have. Verse 3c says, they all were given beauty treatments. And this is not a beauty treatment for a day. This is for a year, ladies. A year. They were being prepped. I don't know if this is the right word. Beautyized? In other words, they wanted to make sure that these women were going to be at their best looking for the king. Verse 12 <laughs> Verse 12 says, before a young woman's turn came to go into the king, she had to complete 12 months of beauty treatments prescribed for the women. Six months with oil of myrrh and six months with perfumes and cosmetics. Now, don't say amen, ladies. <laughs> because some of us husbands would say, I can't afford that. <laughs> I'll send you one day to massage envy and that's about it. <laughs> it took an entire year, an entire year for them to prepare these women to be presented to this king. 
this narcissistic, self-centered king who now is lonely. I got rid of the queen. I put together this decree, but I find myself lonely. And I want a beautiful queen to replace Vashti. That's why that five-word phrase, he began thinking about Vashti. And more than likely, we're reading into Scripture a little here, more than likely, he began thinking about her because he missed her. He missed his wife. He missed the queen. In a relatively short period of time, oops, excuse me. In a relatively short period of time, one's outer beauty can be enhanced. But this was a year of time. But the cultivation of beauty within, there is no shortcut. Amen? It's a developing of your character. It's a developing of who you are as a Christian, as a woman that follows Jesus Christ. No matter all the beauty treatments that you could take at Massage Envy for a year, the Holy Spirit is the one who develops us first inside. Amen? Because that's where God wants to see. Jesus, G, Mrs. White says that at the last days, we need to have a character of Christ, which is a beautiful character, a sweet character, one that cares for others, one that serves the Lord. While the harem is going through this cosmetic city, the king is thinking about Miss Persia. He's thinking about this beauty pageant, this incredible chain of events that's going to take place. First century Jewish historian named Josephus. How many have ever heard of Josephus? Okay, a number of you. Josephus was a contemporary of Jesus. Look at Josephus not just as a historian, but he was like a, a, a news reporter. He was like someone that would follow Jesus and what Jesus was doing and report on him. And this is what he says. He estimated that there were roughly 25 million people in the Persian Empire at that time, including several million women. We don't know how long the king's beauty search lasted, but Josephus noted that the initial screening criteria narrowed likely candidates down to around 400 women. Can you imagine? Not even the Miss Universe pageant could compete with this. Around 400 women. Verse 5 says this, at that time there was a Jewish man in the fortress of Susa whose name was what? Mordecai. Mordecai comes onto the scene before the eventual queen, son of Jarar. He was from the tribe of Benjamin and was a descendant of Kish and Shimei. Mordecai is a very important personality in this story. Some of us have cousins or uncles like a Mordecai. Verse 6, his family had been among those with King Jehoiachin of Judah, had been exiled from Jerusalem to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. Now let's take a step back and remind ourselves that after ne Nebuchadnezzar, the Jews that were taken from the promised land, not, it wasn't Israel yet, but the Jews that were kidnapped by King Nebuchadnezzar, and you know some of those Jews were the three amigos, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, okay? So when the King Nebuchadnezzar went and abducted the young Jewish people, he got the best and the brightest. But he abducted hundreds of Jews, perhaps even thousands. And so after the, king, the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar, the Jews had the ability to go back to the promised land. And many of them did, but many of them didn't because they were established in Persia. They were entrepreneurs. They were perhaps people of importance. They had already made a living for themselves. And so their choice was not to go back to the promised land, but to stay in Persia and raise their family. 
and Mordecai was one of them. Let me go back to verse 5. Mordecai, son of Jair, he was from the tribe of Benjamin, so he was a Jew. And Mordecai was one of those who was at the fortress of Susa. His family had been among those who were exiled from Jerusalem to Babylon. His family decided to stay in Persia. They were well off. The transitional phrase here is at that time there was a Jewish man in the fortress or the palace of Susa. He will begin to see this unknown wise. We're going to see Mordecai replacing the Mimukans. Because now he will be this very wise older man with this obscure young lady by the name of Esther. And we will see that Esther is actually his younger cousin. Mordecai is approximately 100 years old. Esther is a teenager, 18, 19, 20 years of age. And he adopts her. We're going to see that. Enter Mordecai, a Jewish man unrelated to the king, no relation to King Xerxes. He was a Jew in this Persian kingdom, living out his life, his life in exile. Yet he is also raising his orphaned, young, much, much younger cousin named, what's her name? Hadassah. He raises Hadassah. The Bible says that Mordecai's family had been carried into exile from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar. If this referred to Mordecai himself, which it did, it was, he was about a hundred years old. Verse 7. This man had a very beautiful and lovely young cousin, Hadassah, who was also called Esther. When her father and mother died, now we know that her parents were immigrants into Persia. And they died. And she's an orphan. And this much older cousin, 100 years of age approximately, he basically does what? He adopts her. He adopts this young cousin. He cares for her as a father would, as an uncle, but he's actually a cousin. Hadassah, who had also been called Esther, when her father and mother died, Mordecai had adopted her into his family and raised her as his own, what? Daughter. That's how much Mordecai loved Esther. Hadassah, her Jewish name, comes from the word myrtle, which means fragrance. Her Persian name, Esther, means star, a reference not only to the star-like flowers of the myrtle, but like a star in the sky. She would become a star for her people, for the Jewish people. And as I said, but it's worth saying over and over, she would become a savior. This young lady who didn't know that Vashti was going to be deposed, who had no clue that she would eventually become the queen to King Xerxes was a star indeed. What we don't see here regarding this Jewish young lady is that Esther was in the minority. Her people, the Jews, came to this land as captives. They were abducted. They didn't go willingly to Babylon. King Nebuchadnezzar took the best and the brightest, the most beautiful, so she was part of the minority in Persia. So she's living an obscure life in a monotheistic home. In other words, in a home that was different than their neighbors. Their neighbors believed in a variety of gods. Yesterday I, I, I received a call from my neighbor. My neighbor's first name, and I know I can say his first name because he would not be watching online, is Yogesh. And he's from India. And Yogesh is just such a nice man. And his wife, Kanak, I think that's how I say her name. 
One day, Yogesh invited me over to his house because I collected his mail for him while they were in India. And um, they are practicing Hindus. And so I was respectful, and I, I went into his house, gave him his mail, and he was so proud of his prayer room. And I really didn't want to go into the prayer room because I knew what I was going to see. It was filled with different statues of different gods. Uh, as a kid, I would have said, and I did say this to myself, I had the eebie-jeebies. I mean, I, I went into that room, but I was very respectful. And can you imagine Esther, a monotheistic home, worshiping one God, the true God, but her neighbor is Yogesh, who worships hundreds of different gods. It was not easy to be a Jew in a non-monotheistic country. And yet, Mordecai raised her to be a believer in the one true God. Amen? In the one true God. Today, it's no different than 2,000 years ago. We live in a very plural, pluralistic world and country. Your neighbors could be Hindus. Your neighbors could be Buddhists. Your neighbors could be someone who worships thousands of different gods. And God expects us to stand for the one true God. Amen? Amen. Yesterday when Yogesh called me, he called me to tell me that Kanak had a stroke. And he allows me, maybe because we're neighbors, maybe because we're friends, but he allows me to say to him, I'm praying for you. And I told him, I want to visit her. Whether it's at the hospital or when she comes home, I want to visit her. And he said to me, she, she can't open her eyes, but she hears you. And I said, Yogesh, just let me know whenever I can come and see her, whether it's at the hospital or at home, I want to see her and I'm praying for her and I'm praying for you. He allows me to say that and I tell him I'm praying to Jesus. I'm not ashamed to say that to him. We have to be able to be bold in our faith in these last days. Amen? Amen. If they have thousands of different gods, I respect that. We have to be bold to be able to say in a pluralistic world, I believe in the one true God. I'm going to be praying to Jesus for you. I'm going to be praying that Jesus will be healing Knock. And I am, and I did. She was living an obscure life in a monotheistic home next to others who were not monotheistic. Verse 8. As a result of the king's decree, Esther, along with many other young women, was brought to the king's harem at the fortress, at the palace of Susa, and placed in Haggai's care. Thousands, hundreds of other women. In the midst of all this, Esther's true beauty, her character comes out. Yes, you could say to yourself, you could say, well, pastor... But she was there because she was beautiful physically. Yes, that's true. That's true. She was. She was probably a knockout. But what impressed eventually the king wasn't just her physical beauty. It was her character. The beautiful thing about Esther is that God chose this young lady 18, 19, 20 years old, who had a godlike character. She was pretty, she was beautiful, but she was Christ like. Amen? So it tells us that you can be physically beauty, beautiful, and yet have a character like Christ. Amen. You could still be sweet, you could still be godly, 
you could still be bold and say to someone, I'm praying for you. Can I help you? In other words, sometimes you and I will be the only Jesus that someone will ever come across. Do you understand what I'm saying? They will see Jesus in you and me. And that's been my goal with Yogesh and his wife. I, I'm not praying that they will be converted. I'm just praying that every time that I see him, and he's a dear neighbor. When we, we left last year to go to Israel, and Yogesh said, can I watch your house? I said, of course, please. We stopped the mail, but you can pick up all the junk stuff that they throw on the porch and, and put in the, in the mailbox. We are friends. Yes, I had the eebie-jeebies going into his prayer room, but we're friends. And to a certain extent, I might be the only Jesus that he sees. I hope you don't misunderstand that. But we reflect the character of Jesus, don't we? Amen? And I want to reflect the character of Jesus to my Hindu neighbors. And that's why Yogesh and I are close friends, probably the closest in, the, in our neighborhood. That's why when I do leave and we leave on vacation, I can call him and I know that he'll come and pick up whatever junk mail is, is thrown on the porch or in the mailbox. It was Esther's character that emerged. It was Esther's demeanor, her Christ-likeness that made her different than all the other women in the kingdom of Persia. Verse 9 says, Haggai was very impressed with Esther and treated her kindly. He quickly ordered a special menu for her and provided her with beauty treatments. In other words, she had a beautiful character, but he wanted to make her even more beautiful on the outside. He also assigned her seven maids. Now, it would kind of be nice to have some maids like that. Assigned her seven maids specially chosen from the king's palace, and he moved her and her maids into the best place in the harem. Let's check six characteristics of Esther's strength and beauty as we wind down this morning from chapter 2. Because these six characteristics that Esther had made her shine like a star in front of the king. It made her stand out. And the same characteristics that I'm going to share with you is what Jesus wants from us in a world that is dead and dying and needs to see Jesus in us. Amen? Amen? And by the way, by the way, just as a caveat, sometimes the only Jesus that someone will know is when they see you and how you carry yourself. When Yogesh, it, Yogesh is a practicing Hindu. And I have to admit, when I went into his room where he had all these idols, I, I, I was praying and I had the eebie-jeebies, I guess, because I'm not used to seeing all these different Hindu idols. But maybe I am the only Jesus that he will see. Amen? Maybe I went into that room and I did praying because there was hundreds of different idols in his prayer room. But I have to try my best to reflect the character of Christ to a Hindu man and to a Hindu wife. Six characteristics of Esther's strength and dignity. First, Esther exhibited a grace-filled charm and elegance. Now, let me take a step back and remind you, Esther is not 40 years old. She's not 50 years old. How old is she approximately? 18. 18 to 20 years of age. Mordecai, her uncle, cousin, had adopted her. 
Mordecai is around a hundred years of around a hundred years old. Mordecai raised her. She had a beautiful heart, as well as probably the physique. She was humble. And most important, she was teachable. So Esther exhibited a grace-filled charm and elegance. In verse 9, the literal translation of the original language says, She lifted up grace before his face. So even though she was brought to the harem reluctantly, she didn't have a bad or sour attitude. She had a great attitude. What was the difference between Esther and all the other women around her as, as they were vying to be Miss Persia? It was her inner qualities that the king saw. In fact, it captured the attention of the king's servants. A humble quality. Different, way different than the 400 or more other women that were being paraded at that time. Verse 10 says, Esther had not told anyone of her nationality and family background because Mordecai had directed her not to do so. There is a time to be discreet. There is a time to witness. And there is a time to witness verbally. And there is a time to witness non-verbally. Amen? And sometimes we have to witness non-verbally by how we carry ourselves. And this is what Esther did. Esther had not told anyone of her nationality and family background because Mordecai, her wise cousin, older cousin, he's probably around 100 years of age, Mordecai said, let your character reflect who you are. And that's what happened. Second, Esther exhibited an unusual restraint, restraint and control. You see, Esther told no one that she was Jewish. Not because she was embarrassed, but her uncle said, Shh, it's how you walk the talk. Amen? Because sometimes that's us. It's how we walk the talk, and then people will see Jesus in you. They'll see you're different. And that's what perhaps Mordecai said to her. Because that's what Mordecai instructed her to do. Her verbal restraint was her virtue. And sometimes that's our virtue too. Because we need to be able to display the character of Christ without even mentioning the word Christ. And people can see that you and I are different. You don't have to hit them over the head preaching to them about Jesus. Because they can see how you are carrying yourself. They can see Jesus in you. It's your character that speaks volumes. Amen? Third, Esther sustained a continually teachable spirit. This is an 18, 19, 20-year-old young lady, and she had a teachable spirit. And her teachable spirit was evident to her uncle, or actually her cousin, Mordecai. Verse 20 says, Esther continued to keep her family background and nationality a secret. She was still following Mordecai's directions, just as she did when she lived in his home. I want to say this quickly. Um, I had the privilege, my, I, I think it was my last quarter or second to the last quarter um, when I was studying at Andrews University. Uh, uh, it, was a long, well, it feels like a long time ago. And I had the privilege to live, to choose to live in Israel. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has a study center in East Jerusalem. My wife pretty much um, supported the decision. And I lived in Israel for the... Um, spring quarter, so it was around five months. And what was interesting about living in Israel is that um, 
you, you met a lot of non-Christians. In other words, Muslims. And so one day in our, in our dorm room there at the Seventh-day Adventist Study Center in East Jerusalem, there were two young men that were inside of our dorm room. And we had, if I remember right, maybe around nine guys sleeping in this room. And um, to make a long story short, when all of my friends, my fellow friends in the room, finished speaking to these two guys, uh, and I had an opportunity to, to talk, I said, do you guys know where you're at? And the one, uh, Haled was his name, said, what do you mean? And I said, do you, do you know where you're at right now? And he said, yeah, I'm in Jerusalem. And I said, no, no, I mean the building. And he said, no. I said, you're in a Seventh-day Adventist Christian study center. And, and he said, what's that? But I had a chance to witness to him. And this is not me. This was the Holy Spirit. He, he was a non-practicing Muslim. And I said to him, Haled, we're like you. And he said, Christians are not like Muslims. And this was a Holy Spirit moment because I said to him, we're like you because we believe in the soon coming of Gisa, Jesus. Because Muslims believe in the second coming of Jesus. And I said, we're like you because we also believe that there will be a judgment. And he said, no Christians believe that. So in other words, I engaged him with things that we share in common. And we do. As Christians, we have a few things in common. After all, Muslims are the third of the monotheistic faiths. What, which is the first? Judaism, the mother religion. Christianity is the second. And Islam is the third. They all claim to be monotheistic religions. Now, Muslims at times, will say that Christians are not monotheistic because they don't understand the Trinity. But the reality is, we are. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is one God. Amen? Not three gods. But I had the opportunity to witness to Haled and, and his other friend. Witness so much that he and I became close friends while I lived in Israel. Very close friends. I was able to witness so much to him that one day, and I will share this quickly, he invited my wife and I, because she had flown in to Israel and stayed with us the last two weeks of the quarter, he invited us to his house. And believe me, I did not want to go to his house because his house was in the West Bank. And I told him, I said, I'm a Christian, but I'm also Jewish. But we became such close friends that he said, no problem. And the, the reason he said no problem was because when my wife flew in from the States, from Michigan, I rented a little car. And at that time in Israel, all the cars had writings on the side. So if you rented it from a Palestinian, it would have what? Arabic writing. But I rented it from a Jewish rent-a-car agency, so it had Hebrew writing. And I told Haled, I said, um, I can't go into, his hometown was Ezaria, which, by the way, Ezaria in the Bible was Bethany. And I was able to tell him, do you know what's famous about your village? Uh, he knew. He said, doesn't Lazarus... Lazarus, and he took us, he took uh, my wife and I to Lazarus's tomb there in, in Bethany or Ezaria. But in other words, the point is we were able to witness to him. I was able to become friends with him and share what we had in common just as much as what we didn't have in common. Amen? Because really in these last days that we're living, as Christians, we need to share and build bridges of what we have in common, not what we don't have in common. Because what, when, you be, when you're able to share what you have in common with a Mormon, a Jehovah's Witness, or a Muslim, 
you're going to make a friend out of them. You're going to make a friend out of them. And that's what we have to do. Amen? We have to make friends first before you can witness to them. You have to be able to share what you have in common with them. And we have a number of things in common with Muslims. Just like we might have a number of things in common with Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons. We have to build bridges rather than put up walls. Amen? So third, Esther sustained a continually teachable spirit. She continued to keep her family background and nationality a secret. She was still following Mordecai's direction, just as she did when she lived in his home. Mordecai, her older cousin, was a wise man, and he said, shh, don't tell anybody that you're Jewish. He wasn't ashamed of that. I'm not ashamed to be a Seventh-day Adventist Christian or a Seventh-day Adventist Christian pastor. But there's a time and a place when we have to walk the talk rather than speak it. Amen? We need to let people see Jesus in us before we can preach Jesus. Amen? Fourth, Esther exhibited an unselfish modesty and authenticity. She was a modest young woman, woman being that she was probably 18, 19, 20 years of age. Verse 12 says this, Before each young woman was taken to the king's bed, she was given the prescribed 12 months of beauty treatments, six months with the oil of myrrh, followed by six months with, spe with special perfumes and ointments. Verse 13, When it was time for her Sorry about that. When it was time for her to go to the king's palace, she was given her choice of whatever clothing or jewelry she wanted to take from the harem. Verse 14. That evening she was taken to the king's private rooms, and the next morning she was brought to the second harem where the king's wives lived. There she would be under the care of... I, I, I don't... Don't believe that that is a Hebrew word. So Arman, is that a Persian word? Okay, never heard of that. Okay. Brian, have you ever heard of that one? Shaj Gaz. If I'm pronouncing it right, I'm not sure. But I guess it's not a Persian word, so we'll move on. <laughs> the king's eunuch in charge of the concubines, she would never go to the king again unless he had especially enjoined her and requested her by name. Verse 15. Esther was the daughter of Abihail, who was Mordecai's uncle. Mordecai had adopted her younger cousin, Esther. When it was Esther's turn to go to the king, she accepted the advice of Haggai, the eunuch in charge of the harem. She asked for nothing except what he suggested, and she was admired by everyone who saw her. She was a modest, respectful, and beautiful young lady. At this time, Esther cannot be more than 20 years of age. And there's a chance of a lifetime for her to have whatever she wanted because she knew that she was in the Miss Persian beauty contest and she was close becoming the queen. So Esther, excuse me, Esther remains true to what she had been taught and abides by the wise counsel of her older cousin Mordecai, believing that, that he knows what's best for her. In other words, he was developing integrity. Amen? He was developing in, her, in his younger cousin an integrity that reflected her being Jewish and a believer in the one true God. Fifth, Esther modeled a kind of winsomeness, regardless of her surroundings. Esther was taken in verse 16 to King Xerxes at the royal palace in, in the early winter of the seventh year of his reign. And the king loved Esther more than any other young woman. Or young women. 
Now, why do you suppose? Because she had inner beauty and outer beauty. Amen? The king saw something different in Esther. The king loved Esther more than any other young women, so he was delighted with her that he set the royal crown on her head and declared her, what? Queen instead of Vashti. That's part of God's sovereignty. How did a young Jewish young lady who never said that she was Jewish, she listened to the wise counsel of her older cousin. She kept her mouth shut, but she had integrity. She loved God, but she didn't go out and, and boisterously say it, I'm Jewish. And yet, it made an impact on the king. The royal crown on her head declared her queen instead of Vashti. It's an amazing thing that she becomes queen, and she never said once that she was Jewish. But she reflected something that appealed to King Xerxes. Webster's Dictionary defines the word charm as the power or quality of giving delight or arousing admiration, an attractive or alluring characteristic. And Esther had charm. She had a charm about her that attracted the king. After all, there was over 400 other young women from all the different provinces, but yet she stood out. Number six, Esther displayed a humble respect for authority. That's evident because she was obedient to her older cousin Mordecai. He adopts her, and rather than being an a, a immature 18 to 20-year-old, she respects his authority, just like if he was her father. So number six, she displays this humble respect for authority. Verse 18 says, to celebrate the occasion, he gave a great banquet in Esther's honor for all the nobles and the officials, declaring a public holiday for the provinces and giving generous gifts to everyone. Verse 20, Esther continued to keep her family background and nationality a secret. She was still following Mordecai's directions, just as she did when she lived in his home. Now, some of you might be asking, was she ashamed of her faith? No. There is a time and a place to boast. There is a time and a place to say to someone, I'm a Christian. There is right timing and wrong timing. Amen? And sometimes people don't care what you tell them. They care more if you care for them. And so Esther was wise enough to listen to her wise, older, 100-year approximately cousin. Esther, even becoming the queen of the land, remembered the wisdom of her guardian cousin and willingly considered his counsel. I'm sure that she knew that she was beautiful on the outside. I'm sure that she knew that she could attract men. She already attracted the attention of King Xerxes. I'm sure that she knew she was hot looking. Can I say that? She was probably hot looking, like my wife, <laughs> if you're watching online. <laughs> but she was humble. She was humble. She was teachable. She loved the authority, the advice, and the wisdom of her older 100-year-old cousin she reflected the character of Christ amen she reflected the character of Christ no wonder her wise cousin said shh don't say anything about being Jewish because there is a right time and a right place to say that you're Jewish there's a right time and a right place to say that I'm a seventh-day Adventist Christian 
Because sometimes you can say that first, but people want to see, do you care enough that you're helping me? Do you care enough to befriend me? Do you care enough of who I am before you start telling me who you are? And that was the wisdom of Mordecai. The wisdom of Mordecai was, Esther, there's going to be a time and a place to be able to say that you're Jewish. And in that time and place, she would become the savior of her people. Verse 21, one day as Mordecai was on duty at the king's gate, two of the king's eunuchs, Begatha and Terash, who were guards at the door of the king's private quarters, became angry at the king and plotted to what? To assassinate him. The drama intensifies. The queen, the soon-to-become queen, now there's an assassination attempt being planned. But Mordecai heard about the plot and gave the information to the queen. She then told the king about it and gave Mordecai credit for the report. What a young lady. Amen? Mordecai heard about the plot, gave the information to Queen Esther. He could have went straight to the king. He was hanging out at the gate of the palace. And by the way, the gate of the palace means that that's where you get all the news. That's where you have, uh, where things happen. But he didn't. He told his much younger cousin. And then she told the king about it and gave Mordecai the credit rather than say, hey, king, Xerxes, I'm not only good looking, but I'm going to share this with you. She didn't. She was a humble young lady. Verse 23. When an investigation was made and Mordecai's story was found to be true, the two men were impaled on a sharpened pole. This was all recorded in the book of the history of King Xerxes' reign. Archaeological digs in Susa have revealed much about the Persian life during the days of King Xerxes. Verse 21 says, one day as Mordecai was on duty at the king's gate. In other words, a city gate was the main location for its citizens to conduct business, grievances, form important friendships and alliances, decide on legal matters, receive the latest news, and much more. And Mordecai was probably at the gate. But he gave the news to his much younger cousin, 18 to 20 year old cousin. So why all this information about a gate? Sitting at the king's gate indicated that Mordecai held a place of respect and authority. Because remember, he told Esther Shh, about being Jewish. And so he practiced what he preached. But yet he sat at the gate, the king's gate, which indicated that he held a place of respect and authority. He's not just passing by, but he had a seat at the gate. And this scenario is reminiscent of the story of Nicodemus in John chapter 19. He held the respected position of a Pharisee, yet he kept secret his interest in Jesus' teaching. You remember the teaching of, Mor of Nicodemus, amen? Nicodemus was a wealthy man, an educated man, an influential man. But he heard about Jesus and he was discreet. He was very discreet. But he, he knew, hey, there's something intriguing about this Jesus. But he was very discreet. John chapter 19, verse 38, later Joseph of Arimathea asks Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a dis disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders, with Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by who? Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. We, you've heard the story. He visited him at night because he didn't want the other Pharisees 
to know that he was interested in Jesus. So he visits, visits Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Verse 40, taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and stripes, strips of linen. This was in accordance with the Jewish burial customs. Verse 41, at the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Verse 42, because it was the Jewish day of preparation. By the way, there's only two days in the scriptures in all the Bible that are mentioned. Amen? One is the Sabbath, and what's the other one? Preparation day. Those are the only two days that are mentioned by title or by name. Sunday is always mentioned as the what? First day. First day. But the only two days that are mentioned in Scripture are preparation day, which is Friday. Luke chapter 23, 24 states that. Preparation day, then the Sabbath. And if you remember the story, then it says on the first day, the women brought the spices, or he resurrected, excuse me. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Nicodemus made the decision to step out of the shadows of secret discipleship to declare through his action that he believed Jesus was the Savior of the world, that Jesus was his Savior. This is a very wealthy, intellectual, entrepreneur type of man. But there was something about Jesus that intrigued him, and he knew, I have to find out more about this man who became his Savior. As Mordecai kept vigil at the gate, what happened in verses 21 and 22? First, Mordecai had been keeping vigil at the gate, so this provided a perfect opportunity to check on Esther and see how she was doing. Because by being at the gate, he's at the front of the palace, of the fortress, and he's interested in his younger cousin. What's going on? I am her guardian. Esther would ensure that the information conveyed was conveyed correctly and properly credited to her older cousin Mordecai. She was humble. She wasn't boisterous. She wasn't egotistical. Hey, King Xerxes, I'm telling you this. So let me get some brownie points. She gave the brownie points to her older cousin, her much wiser cousin. And second, as a non-native Persian, Mordecai likely wanted to demonstrate his loyalty to and support of the king. He wanted to, to show the king that he was one of his subjects. That you don't need to fear me because eventually the truth of Mordecai and cousin Esther would come out that they're Jews in a foreign land. So in this sermon series, God Behind the Scenes, chapter 2 of Esther has led us on a journey through a beauty pageant, the Miss Persia beauty pageant. Beauty treatments that lasted a year, ladies. Just don't ask for a gift card from your husband for a year, okay? Harem life and Esther receiving the queen's crown. This real life story has many twists, however. One thing remained constant. God's, what? Faithful guiding hand in the lives of his people then and now. This story is a story that we can embrace. Because as God guided Mordecai and Esther, he guides us in his own sovereignty. Amen? For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers... Neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to what? Separate us from the love of Christ, the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's